Welcome to Out With Dan, the podcast that spotlights and examines the voices of LGBTQ plus authors, characters, and our allies. Together, we lift our voices and we tell our stories. I'm Dan White. Join me as I chat with this week's author. Hello, and welcome back to Out With Dan. Today, I'm absolutely honored to talk with Hank Philippi Ryan. Hank is a USA Today bestselling author of 15 novels of suspense. She has won multiple prestigious awards, including five Agathas, five Anthonys, and the coveted Mary Higgins Clark Award. As an investigative reporter with WHDH-TV in Boston, Hank has won 37 Emmys, 14 Edward R. Murrow Awards, and dozens of other honors. I'm absolutely delighted to have you, Hank. Thank you for being here. Oh, my complete pleasure. I'm so glad to be home after this book tour. I've been on the road for six solid weeks. I have seen so many sunrises. I don't even want to go into it. I will say that I've had such a delight watching your tour. It's really nice to see how many different places you went to. The book is One Wrong Word, and you get a face pick, which I absolutely love. You have to send me that. I'll put that right up on my website. Look at We will. I will happily do it. I love it. Who came up with the idea of the book cover? Well, as always in publishing, as you well know, it is a collaborative effort. It is team. It is a teamwork. We have a marvelous art department at Forge. And I had said to them that I wanted a cover that was some word like relatable so that you would know, so that readers would know that the book was about a person who could be them, that this wasn't outrageous, that this was something that has happened in real people's lives, they could be the main character. How can we get people to understand that they could be the main character? Well, the genius, brilliant brains at Forge Books, my publisher's uh, art department, Katie Klimowitz, first of all, came up with the idea of having a book cover that everyone could be. And when you hold this book up, and it's the coolest thing, Dan, somehow our brains make every person's face be the other half of this book cover face. And it's all, it's kind of cool. And it's, <laughs> and it's almost disturbing. And it's almost disturbing. And now I have people sending me like dogs. You know? <laughs> 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 it's great men. It works. It's really genius. So it, it uh, absolutely is. And I see, on all of your stops, everyone was willing to participate, which is always a nice thing too, because as an author, that must be wonderful because you get to really engage with the person. Oh, absolutely. You're so incredibly right. And I take the photos. So I say, hold the book up, hold it right there, up, down, over, and I, and I snap it. And then I show it to them. And one of the joys of my life is seeing their faces when they see that they are the cover, when they see that they are the cover. It's quite a moment every time. It's marketing genius. It really, really is. So give the audience a little elevator pitch about what this book is about. Okay. One Wrong Word is about rumor and scandal and gossip and betrayal and revenge because one wrong word can ruin your life, right? And no one knows that better than crisis management expert Arden Ward. Arden Ward, uh, who is savvy and smart and adept at handling crises in other people's lives, has suddenly realized that she is being forced to manage a crisis in her own life. She has been falsely accused. She would never do this, never do such a thing. She's been falsely accused of having an affair with a powerful client. Um, And that's not true. We love Arden. She's amazing. But her boss believes this rumor. Uh, and Arden is about to be fired. So in order to save her career and her job, she's given one last chance, one last job, and that is to repair the reputation of a guy named Ned Bannister. (coughs) Ned Bannister is a Boston business mogul, a real estate genius who uh, was just acquitted in court of vehicular homicide. But even though the jury found him not guilty, the court of public opinion still thinks Ned Bannister is a killer and that's ruined his life 
and ruined his wife's life and ruined the lives of his two adorable children. They're all being shunned and ignored and dismissed. Uh, and it's terrible. They've, they've had their lives taken away by this verdict that they thought would fix them. So Arden, de Arden devotes the last two weeks of her job potentially to helping this shattered family and convincing the world that Ned Bannister is actually a good guy. But as the truth begins to emerge, so do Arden's doubts, and she begins to worry whether she might be protecting a killer. So two smart characters facing off in a high-stakes psychological cat and mouse game to prove their truth about a devastating crime. But which character is the cat and which character is the mouse? And that is one wrong word. And I don't think anyone on the face of the earth could have described this delicious read any better than that. The author has done such a great job. Hank, I tell you, it is, you are 100% right that anyone who reads your book will root for Arden. Everyone will fall in love with Arden. She's smart, she's classy, and she's really relatable because in, in life, one wrong word really can damn your entire world, your career, your personal life. I think I heard on an interview, you had something sort of similar to that in your life or yeah. adjacent, maybe. Might well, be a you're so right. That's exactly right, Dan. I mean, I think all of us have had in our lives someone say something about us that's just not true. And what do we do? You know, do you fight back? Do you uh, ignore it? Do you laugh? Do you defend yourself? It's, it's, it's really impossible to sort of... Uh, fix, repair, uh, restore your reputation once it gets damaged. It is just endless, especially now with social media, you're doomed. Absolutely right. Uh, and so what, I decided to write a book about that, about how quickly someone's reputation can be ruined, uh, whether on purpose or not. And you think about, and I promise I'll get to the story, you think about words as deadly weapons, a, a yes. deadly weapon that we all carry, right? We all have our, the power of our words. Um, and I wanted to write a book about that. And as I was about a quarter of the way through the book, I realized that I was writing a fast paced thriller about rumors and greed and gossip and revenge, but I was also writing about myself. And that was kind of a moment, I have to say, because I was sitting here at this very desk, you know, with the bay window and the sugar maple trees outside, writing this book that I was already in love with. Um, and I realized that I was, as I said, I was writing about myself and something that happened to me when I was 19. I mean, that was such a long time ago. Um, I was, yeah, I know. I was working in a political campaign back home in Indiana. Um, and I mean, I was a worker bee. I was the gopher. I got coffee. I folded and stuffed to news releases. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I thought I was among the people who were going to change the world. And this was this was wonderful for a 19-year-old. It is now. Um, but I was walking down the hall and I overheard a conversation. You know how you perk up when you hear your name? So absolutely. I like, I heard my absolutely. Name. And it was two campaign managers. And I won't use anybody's real names in this, of course, except for mine. Uh, two campaign managers talking, talking, and one of them was saying, have you heard about the crush that Jim has on Hank? Jim, not his real name, obviously, was the campaign manager, big, big mogul. <laughs> and I thought, Jim has a crush on me? You know, that's news to me. I had no idea about that. And then the other, the second man said, yeah, you know, everybody's talking about it. And if Jim's wife ever gets wind of this, it's going to be a disaster. And I thought, Jim's wife? Yeah, disaster? What are you talking about? The, I can't <laughs> how baffled I was by this. So the second man says, well, you know, what do you think we should do about it? And the first guy said, well, I have been thinking about it. And my solution is that we should fire Hank. And I thought, fire me? Fire me. Me, right. I, I think Jim's your problem. You know, I think Jim's the problem in this situation. <laughs> I, but I, but the thing was, and the thing that was so profoundly disturbing to me, and still is, is that they needed Jim. They needed Jim for the campaign. He was the head of the whole thing. I was the workery. So they right. could get rid of me. I was the expendable one. I was the innocent one. I was the victim, but I was the expendable one. Uh, they were willing to throw me under the bus to make Jim's wife happy. 
and to keep the campaign in equilibrium and not to have bad publicity about something that wasn't true. True. That's they were right. willing, they were willing to murder my reputation. They were willing to murder my reputation to get what they wanted. And you know, think about that. How I mean, poor little me, I think about myself now and how I didn't do anything. And I was sitting here at this desk thinking, you know, I should have said something. I should have defended myself. So I thought, yeah, you know, let me see if I can have Arden Ward be me and do what I should have done. I mean, it's sort of a love letter to my 19 year old self saying, I love that. saying, you know, here's what you should have done, sister. Here's what you should have said. And it was so much fun to have me be able to, you know, type what I should have said. I have Arden Ward say what I should have said and do what I should have done and be take back her power uh, as I should have done back then. So, you know, um, it was really fun for me to sort of knit up the raveled edges of my own personal history through fiction. So, you know, this is a fast paced thriller. I want you to like miss your stop on the subway because you're reading this. You book. will. You absolutely will. Or lose sleep trying to finish it before you go to bed. I one hope, or the other. <laughs> I hope so. But now you've, now you've, now you've asked me to tell the rest of the story and you readers now will see where that came from, where the passion came from, where the sort of um, shock came from, um, and and where the impetus came from, where the motivation came from. And to, I can't begin to tell you how many people on this tour have come up to me and said, oh, this happened to me. This exact same thing happened to me when we were all young, you know, when we were all young and the balance of power was so off and we didn't know enough to deal with it yet? How did we deal with that? Um, and there were expectations and there were pressures and there were all kinds of things like that. And we all dealt with them. So I get to face that in one wrong word. I do have to say really quickly, in one wrong word, um, there's mur there are murders, but in my real life, there were not. There were Thank no goodness. I, I'm happy to hear that. I will say one thing is, I. so the title is One Wrong Word, but I found that the most important one to me was the word word, because a lot of your characters gave their word on different things that they didn't keep their word. Some did, some didn't. I mean, you know, uh, Arden's boss, Warren, he doesn't keep his word. He assures her he'll do this, this, and this, and yet he doesn't. Monel, on the other hand, gave her word that she could make Arden's life a hell, and she certainly tried for a while, which I like that because I noticed this thing is... It is, as you say, we have this tool in our toolbox, a word done the right way or the wrong way can really ruin someone's life or repair it. So wise. I mean, I've been a television reporter for 43 years. You know, I've wired myself with hidden cameras and confronted corrupt politicians and chased down criminals um, and gone undercover and in disguise. And I know what people look like when they're lying. And I've dealt with so many crisis management experts like Arden Ward is, like her boss Warren Carmichael is. And their job is to shepherd us, the, those of us in the public, into seeing the world in a certain way, to believing that certain things are true, whether they are or whether they aren't. There's a story that they're paid to tell. And some crisis management experts like Arden Ward do that for good. They are, they're bringing out both sides of the story. They're making sure people aren't defamed. They're making sure that people understand what really happened in a situation. Other crisis management experts who will remain unnamed um, are trying to fix someone's reputation unfairly. They're trying mm -hmm. to paper over a mistake. They're trying to do sort of sleight of hand by word saying, oh, look over there instead of looking at the truth. Um, and as a reporter, I've dealt with that so often. And I have to, I've learned to ask myself, who gains by having the story be portrayed this way? Why would you tell me the story in this particular way? And I've learned, I hope, to put together the various pieces of people's stories and come to the truth, to come to find the truth. I mean, I don't mean to sound woo-woo and highfalutin, but all, you know, in all of my life, as a highfalutin. No, no. So... I think it's important to really point out the fact that when someone is a truth teller, Hank, how very important that is. Because, you know, in today's world of social media and sometimes in journalism, the truth is not important to a lot of people. So they want to make the story what they want it to be. In the old days, we would say, oh, you know, he always catches the biggest fish. Wherever he goes, his fish is the biggest. 
But we've come to accept that as a society, which is sad to me. I mean, we have before the Supreme Court, a former president who believes he is not answerable to anyone. Where we got in our society that that is a, even in the Supreme Court, is a shame to me. It's really heartbreaking. No one should be above the law. I mean, it's 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 disturbing every day to see how truth has been beaten up and twisted to become what you want to believe, what someone tells you to believe, what someone tells you to believe over and over and over as right. if that's the matter, what, tell, what someone tells you to believe more and more loudly and how we have um, reinforced each other's beliefs so that so that it's not even discussable what, you know, and I want to say, you know, there's a truth that, and this is not it, you know, this, this is the truth. And that has been over my 40 plus years as a reporter. I mean, I'm also married to a criminal defense and civil rights attorney, and both of our lives have been focused on getting to the truth. And every day as a reporter, I'm getting to the truth. And my book, Trust Me, well, on the cover says, uh, the cut line is, there are three sides to every story yours, mine, and the truth. And my search is for the truth and the pathway to discover that. And that's why, as you say, the, the words and promises in one wrong word um, are, the, are the engine that drives this story. And there's so many, you've really created so many relatable characters in your story. I mean, really, we get the prosecutors and the defense attorneys and what they have to do, all these people end up having to work together to solve the mystery of this book. And I love the fact that, you know, sometimes we really do have to reach out to people that we may not be aligned with naturally to get to the truth, because the truth really should be tantamount of the most importance always. I mean, the truth is just that it's the truth and something that's spun is not necessarily the truth. So I do want to point out one phrase that I that when I got to it in your book, it just sort of it bowled me over and I will never look at the moon the same way again. So you described the moon when Arden and Pipper in the woods in Vermont as the moon is either half full or half empty because of the lighting. And it's something I will never look at the moon, a half moon again the same way, because, you know, everybody knows that analogy for a glass of water. But also when you're looking for moonlight or any kind of light at night, it is true that the moon was half empty on that night. And I loved that. Thank you. I sometimes, you know, getting into the writer brain is an interesting discussion because I don't know where that came from, if if I can say that. You've talked to millions of authors and you sort of and you get this, that there are times that when I'm lucky or open or something, um, I'm writing things that I promise you that I didn't consciously think of. Okay. That I'm, you know, when I'm Arden Ward, when I'm writing from Arden Ward's point of view, as I was in that scene, um, I am Arden Ward. I am seeing the world through Arden Ward's eyes and feeling it through her soul and heart and passion and wants and desires and needs and fears. I'm, I, I am her. Um, when I'm writing Cordelia Bannister, I see the, you know, I'm sure my posture even changes. It changed when I even talked to you about it. When I'm writing Cordelia Bannister, I'm her and I see the world through her eyes. And when I'm Monell Churchwood, the obsessive, determined DA who only wants to put Ned Bannister in prison, <laughs> I see it through those blinders. You know, what, yep. what will she do to get him in prison and how far will she go to get it? And what will each of these women learn about each other? Because every... They each want a different thing and only one of them can win. So it's, it was a real uh, experience for me to be as a writer, to be each of those women and see the world through their eyes. And the half empty, half full is, is a metaphor for Arden's entire life. You know, it's either going to be really great or it's going to be really terrible. And right now it can go either way. Yes, I agree. You also created a large cast of strong women. Strong, maybe some for the good, some for the bad. Patience, which I love the fact that you named that character Patience. Um, she's not, she's a strong woman, but not necessarily for good. She just happens to be rich and powerful or married to someone rich and powerful. And so I love the the cast of strong women characters. Is that something you do in most of your novels? You know, it is. And I do not, and I, 
I don't know if I should admit this. I mean, I don't consciously do it. I don't sit down at this desk and say, okay, cast of strong women characters. I don't do that. It is how it comes out. And I have had other people, meaning my editor, say, <laughs> you know, there, are lot, there are lots of women in this story. Why did you make people women? Um, and I didn't make them women. They just came out. To they be, came that way. That's right. That way. Um, but I do think that uh, in the world, the way it is now, that is um, authentic. And that is how our lives often are, uh, especially certain segments of society. And there are a lot of women in power and a lot of women who need to prove themselves. Now, you'll notice that in this in this group of powerful women, every single one of them is essentially controlled or tried to be controlled by a man. So these are women on their way up who are working to be successful, who are ambitious, all of whom want something. But, sure. the, but the entity that's in charge of them is a man. And you'll see that parallel when you read the book. I, all of you, I hope, no pressure. It's just my career. <laughs> you know, so and I think that that's the thing that so for me, I'm such a feminist and I and I'm very proud of that. And I think that the most gifted person should always be at the top. But I do see that, sadly, this world is still controlled a lot by misogyny and by men who think because they're rich or powerful or because they're at the top of the, the ladder that they can do things that they should never do. And that's one of the things that you you bring into this book so artfully that I just because I did see that I saw that no matter who the strong woman was, there was a man who may not give her her due or her credit. And unfortunately in life, I think that still happens. Yes, We're working for it not to happen, but until this world changes more than it is currently, it, we're still in a pickle, of a bit of a pickle anyway, so. There are lots of assumptions about relationships and lots of assumptions about power. And one of the things I love to do in my books is to sort of open the door to that and say, see what you're really seeing here. See what's really going on here. You know, see where the credit gets taken. See who really does the work. See how women uh, put up with that or not. Um, I, 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 I agree with you. I hope things are changing. It seems um, incremental. Yes, it, and not nearly fast enough. And I mean, it really, we should be at the point where we understand that we're all humans and we all matter. And no one is better than anyone else, no matter what their gender is, no matter how tall or short they are, no one is better than the next person. I'm about to get out my preacher soapbox here in a minute. <laughs> I'm getting the popcorn. So I I do want to ask if naming the children Pip and Emma was an homage to Agatha Christie. You know, they just were named Pip and Emma. They were always Pip and Emma. I, you know, I, I don't characters names, Monel Cheatwood, Cordelia Bannister, I mean Churchwood, I no, Cordelia Bannister. I don't know where those names come from. Um, they just come out. Pip and Emma, that's just what their names were. Got and, you. you know, I was a Shakespeare major in college, so you'll see Arden and Cordelia, and they're in all of my books. There's it's it's subconscious, but they're just in my brain. Pip and Emma from Agatha Christie. Why is that even? Um, a murder is announced. The their their brother and sister Pip and Emma. So when I saw it, I was like, oh my goodness, I wonder if this was that. So it was oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because Agatha Christie was such a fundamental, life-changing author for me. Um, and now, I mean, I remember reading Murder on the Orient Express just when I was like 12 or something and just being sure. overwhelmed by that, how clever it was and how careful it was and how fair it was and how surprising it was. All of you who haven't read it, I can't believe you haven't, but go, not right now, but when the children go, go get Murder on the Orient Express. And now, you know, 50 years later, 60, after all, my time as, a, as an author to win awards named for Agatha Christie, those teapots you see behind me, those are Agatha Awards I named love for Agatha Christie. Um, to have her be so seminal to me and then to have, the, you know, to have her give me the gift of those two names uh, without even knowing it. Um, I, I love that. I, I love that. So, you know, you used a word with Agatha that I want to use for you 
the word fair. You know, I will say that all of the characters you created in One Wrong Word were fair characters. I felt like they were, I felt like I knew every character in your book. And I don't mean that lightly. I mean that very seriously. And I think you dealt with them fairly. I didn't feel that you pulled any punches. I felt like I had met all of these people. I had certainly seen what one wrong word can do. And the very first job I had off the farm, that happened at a company I worked for. And the man was transferred because someone said they were having an affair, he and a coworker, and they were not. But one wrong word changed his entire life, or at least the, the wow. direction he was going in, for sure. Wow. So it's I mean, that, you know, that's so disturbing and so unsettling, and it does show you how this happens. And sometimes people don't talk about it. You know, you don't, you don't want to bring it up because then it brings it up again. Well, and I also think that, you know, one thing that you mentioned earlier is about your 19-year-old self, you didn't fight back, but I'm not really sure that maybe you had the toolbox to be able to fight back. And really, I'm assuming then they'd have just said, oh, she's trying to cover it up. And that that only makes it worse when you're not believed. That's okay. one of the things about Arden. She assures Warren that there is no affair. And then he doesn't believe her or he doesn't want to believe her is the way I read it. You know, and it's like, He'd rather have that client that's more important to him than someone's reputation. He says so. You know, he absolutely says so, which is everybody's pretty open about what they want. I mean, that is very clear in the story. And, and thank you for talking about being fair, because as a reader, you know, there's nothing worse than having the ending of a book be something that where you think, the what? The left-handed <laughs> brother from Australia? That, that was not even in here. Or, you know, or you can't, when a, sometimes, and I, and I tell my students this, um, confusion isn't the same as suspense. Confusion is confusion. And, un, and you can't, you can't, we know as readers, I know my readers are really smart. And my readers know when I'm actively withholding something for, from them. So I just don't do that. I don't actively withhold. I, I tell you everything. It's just that, you know, in my writer's sleight of hand, in my writer trick bag is I'm getting you to look over here when you should be really looking over here, just like a crisis management expert does. I want you to think about the world in a certain way and then find out later that you're wrong. But it's just because you didn't look at it the right way. Absolutely. And you did it so masterfully. Once again, the book is One Wrong Word. Hank, do you have a website or social media you would like to share? Yes, absolutely. So I'm on social media way too much. It's tragic. I'm on Instagram at, at Hank P. Ryan, at Hank P. Ryan, on Facebook at Hank Philippi Ryan author. I'm kind of on X. I'm kind of on threads. Not totally. Um, my website is HankPhilippiRyan.com. No matter how you spell it, you'll get it. HankPhilippiRyan.com, where you can uh, see all the news and info about One Wrong Word. I also have a newsletter um, that on my website, you can go to contact and click on my newsletter and sign up for that. Also, if you email me from my newsletter on contact, it comes right to me, not any inter, you know, there's no intermediary, you know, there's no associate who's looking at that. If you click on contact, it comes right to me. So I'd love, love, love to hear from your fans, Dan. Thank you. Oh, how wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. This has been an absolute pleasure. My absolute pleasure on this end in Boston as well. And you send me your face. You send me. I will. I will pop that right up. Perfect. I'll be happy. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of Out with Dan. You can find more information about this podcast and its host at outwithdan.com, on Twitter at outwithdan, and on Instagram and Facebook at gooutwithdan. This podcast is hosted by Authors on the Air Global Radio Network, and the theme music is provided by bensound.com. Join us again soon for the next episode of Out with Dan.